please have a seat. There's a, I, I, I drew the image that I'm talking about and I made a print out of it for everyone to have one. So tonight's gonna be a little different than my normal talks that I give. There's only a handful of you in here that I think have seen some of my normal talks, which are pretty rapid fire, lots of imagery. Um, I improv quite a bit. But for this time around, I actually wrote an essay that I'm going to be reading about my relationship to photography and my relationship to this piece, World's Fair in New York City by Gary Winogrand. So um, I promise my reading voice isn't boring. It will not put you to sleep. <laughs> but um, I, I do appreciate you spending the next hour or so with me as I reflect on this piece and hopefully what will lead to a, a pretty interesting conversation with you all too. Okay, so thank you. I draw every day, but before I drew, I photographed. When I would visit my grandparents in Kenosha, Wisconsin in the 1980s, a camera was always in my face. It was my grandfather's camera. He was a professional illustrator with charcoal and oil portraits being his bread and butter, and photographing his subjects was a huge part of his process. His studio was filled with camera and lighting equipment, and his basement wasn't filled with traditional basement-like things, such as a workbench and tools, but it was filled with a darkroom and photochemicals. He was a rapid-fire photographer. He blew through roll after roll during his portrait sittings, and he would blow through roll after roll when he was taking family photos, too. He would also just blow roll after roll during what I had originally thought were boring moments, too. People walking on the sidewalk, me watching TV. It was fascinating to me at how long we would have to pose for family shots at holidays, or for simple shots that celebrated zero occasion. It irritated my mom and always annoyed my grandmother. Taking a picture never involved just a few shots. It involved a few rolls. However, I was mesmerized and I wanted in. It looked like such an active activity. I was a pretty restless kid and always wanted to be doing something with my hands. I didn't like waiting around for things to happen. With a camera, it looked like you could make things happen. You could orchestrate the show. He gave me my first camera when I was eight. It was a Canon AE-1, and I had no idea what I was doing with it. It was too much of a camera for me to comprehend at the time, and my mom was pretty afraid that I would break it. She traded me for a blue plastic Fisher-Price camera that shot 110 film. 110 film was what I considered film for babies. The roll was shaped like a tiny telephone receiver, and the film was returned to you in miniature negative strips. It also had black padded grips so you wouldn't drop it. Yeah, it was a camera for babies, but I didn't care. I could start making things happen. I started blasting through the plastic 110 film rolls. I loved the way the flash bulbs smelled when they were freshly blown, and I have vivid memories of breaking open the bulbs to see what was inside. Just some toxic dust and glass that was held together by a thin coat of plastic. Super safe stuff, I'm sure. The flash bulbs were the same as the bulbs that I currently use to expose screens with my GoCo screen printer. To this day, I still like to gently mash hot bulbs between my fingers after they've been exposed. It's a weird toxic comfort, I suppose. Pictures of the TV and cats were my main subjects. Too bad the internet didn't exist then. My Tumblr would have been huge. My mom and I would drop off the exposed rolls at our local department store. A week later, I would receive my, my pictures. Cat faces, blurry ceilings, shots of the inside of my mouth. Would that be considered a selfie? And TV screenshots of Smurfette and Mr. T all went on my walls. Eventually, my mom told me that I would either have to be more selective with my picture taking 
or I was going to have to use my allowance to pay for film processing. I loved taking pictures, but even at that young of an age, I knew that I loved money more. So I slowed down. Sometimes I would shoot my camera with no film, you know, just for fun. As the years went on, I eventually learned how to use that old Canon AE-1 and took it with me to college where I had 24-hour darkroom access and I learned how to roll my own film. Game on. I started learning about other photographers. When I was in high school, I became enamored with Diane Arbus and Cindy Sherman. In college, my photography professor worshipped at the altar of Robert Frank, Lee Friedlander, William Iggleston, and Gary Winogrand. Photographers whom, at first glance, seemed super boring. I didn't have time for boring. I was too busy organizing photo shoots of my friends and having them dress up in ridiculous costumes and orchestrating what I thought at the time were incredibly clever and impactful scenarios that really spoke to what was important about my life. Hey, let's all dress up like produce and roll down a hill was one high concept that I executed. I thought that the world was lame and that I had to stage interest in order to photograph something that was interesting. My photo professor thought I was dramatic with an extreme flair for ridiculousness. But what 20-year-old girl who likes to dress her friends up as avocados wasn't, you know? When we would look at Winogrand in class, my eyes would glaze over. Why would I search for meaning in a photo with a bunch of women on a bench when I could coordinate 15 friends to dress in rainbow colors and throw pies at each other? Side note, my college job was working at a place called Branson Photo. Branson, Missouri is a tourist town filled with country music. And my primary job at Branson Photo was to photograph tourists who would go to country music theaters and pose them with costumed country music performers before they entered the theater. After the show started, I ran out to a photo processing booth in the parking lot, developed and printed between 10 and 15 rolls of film, and then sold these five by seven photos at intermission for $8 a pop. I never once thought this job was interesting. I would throw away hundreds of unsold tourist photos every night. A parade of interestingness was pranced before me every night, hours at a time, and I never once thought to really look. I also shot beauty pageants and felt the exact same way. The 20-year-old me was such a dumbass. <laughs> to understand Gary Winogrand, you must be willing to look. At that time, I thought I was too busy to look, too cool to look, too above it all to look, too distracted to look. A few years later, I went to graduate school for design. And in order to fulfill an art history credit, I enrolled in the history of photography. We met three times a week for two hours in a pitch dark room. Our job was to look. Our job was to learn how to see. We trained our brains to slow down by talking and looking at hundreds upon hundreds of images. One of the hundreds of images that we looked at or those women on the bench, or now better known to me as Winogrand's World's Fair, New York City. The image of the woman on the long public bench filled up the dark room. I looked at their hair, their clothing, their faces, their expressions. I heard the whispering, and I recognized and identified with the awkward positioning of their bodies. Was he celebrating women? Was he making fun of the woman? Was he doing both? I thought about the 1960s. I thought about New York City. I thought about living in New York City in the 1960s. I felt equal parts joy and uneasiness. This time, it wasn't boring. 
This time, I couldn't get it out of my head. This photo was a catalyst for me realizing that I could never stage something as interesting as real life. This photo was a catalyst for me to pick my camera up again. Gary Winogrand's World Fair, New York City, pushed me towards other photographers like Stephen Shore and William Eggleston and Martin Parr. I dug deeper and discovered a love for Beatrice Abbott and Eugene Ache as well. I picked my camera back up again, something that I had previously put down because my interest in design had taken its place. At that time, I was just starting to make work about material goods, money, and how we attach emotions to gifts and purchases. But I didn't really know what I was doing with these ideas yet. So instead of sitting in my studio, staring at my notebook, I took my camera and I went to look for people engaging with material things and how we engage with each other when consumer goods are our main focus. I started to look and shoot and not hesitate. I was thinking through shooting. And I do this when I draw. I am thinking through making. For me, making is thinking. I wasn't aimless, though. I still had my control, but I controlled where I was looking and going and not creating staged environments to shoot. Instead, I controlled myself. I set up a schedule. Every Tuesday, I would go to thrift stores and shoot and look and talk to people. Every Thursday, I would go to Target and photograph people with their carts and ask them about what they were buying and why. Every Saturday, I would go to yard sales and document objects and talk with people about the things that they were selling and the things that they were buying. Gary Winogrand's brazenness on the street was a permission giver to me and how I operated with people. Reflecting back, however, I learned more from him than just smiling, and at, smiling at and talking to strangers. So here are eight things that I learned from Gary Winogrand in no particular order. Number one, make piles of work. Whether that means shooting a ton or making drawing after drawing after drawing, Winogrand is my spirit animal when it comes to making piles of work. He was a prolific shooter. Article after article make reference to how many rolls of film he shot in his lifetime and how many rolls were left to be developed after his death. It's been calculated that he shot around 5,418,000 photographs. Exposing hundreds of frames a day, his practice resulted in an innate sensitivity to nuance and composition, AKA, the more you do something, the better you get at it. You should be intentional with your work, but don't limit yourself to how much you make. He would say, when in doubt, click. Number two, work fast and think later. Hesitation can be crippling. It's so easy to fall into the cycle of creativity that goes a little something like this when you're starting a project. Oh, this is awesome. Wait, oh, this is actually hard. OK, yes, I have confirmed that what I am making is complete crap. Wait, never mind. I am the thing that is actually complete crap. And scene. <laughs> this cycle is common. I have discovered that it is best to keep making so you can power through before the crap thoughts creep in. Reflect later, or in Winogrand's case, don't even reflect that much at all and just keep making. I am not advocating for zero reflection. It's just that it's really, really, really easy to talk yourself out of doing things, especially when first starting out on something new. This is why a lot of my projects have rules to follow. These rules keep me moving forward, so I have to keep making, even when it feels kind of awkward. Rules push you through so you can keep making and then reflect upon what you have made. 
Number three, process is sometimes more interesting than the final. The physical act of taking the picture interest Winogrand the most. He said about shooting, the process of taking that point in time is sometimes more memorable than the actual print. It's an adventure in seeing. For me, the process of taking pictures led to other non-photo based projects whose final results were more interesting than the original photos that led me there in the first place. The process pushed me forward. The process of shooting taught me structure and taught me how to learn to begin to see. I am continually learning from this process. Number four, sometimes the boring things are the most interesting things or look for the unsettling in the settled. Leo Rubenfein said of Winogrand's work, one side is a great exuberant warmth a love of the plebeian energy of American life. And the other side is persistent despair, that it's all out of control and that it will end up badly. The two are so welded to each other that in any one of the best photos, you don't know whether to feel elated or horrified, and you feel both. I like gray areas. I like unease. I like the alienated underdog. I think this is why I also like David Lynch and David Byrne and Jonathan Richman. I like my humor to be a little sad and my sad to be a little funny. Searching and successfully hitting that uneasiness is complicated because sad is easy, funny is easy. The in-between is hard, but the in-between is where the good stuff happens. He believed that worlds could be revealed by scrutinizing the ordinary. I can only hope to hit that place with my own work. I try, but I feel like the aim is off most of the times. But I'm going to keep trying, of course. Number five, be a completionist. Winogrand has called himself a student of America, and he seemed to want to document all of America as well. Maybe he never articulated that he was trying to photograph everyone and everything in America, but I feel like his actions and the sheer volume of work that he created spoke for him instead. I admire people who aspire to be completionists, whose reach sometimes overextends what is actually capable of being executed. Number six, there is art in the everyday. Because of the Facebooks, the Instagrams, and the Twitters, more and more people are documenting their everyday and sometimes incredible ways and being able to easily share. I feel like this should be owed a bit to Winogrand, who really gave permission to document life in such seemingly ordinary yet extraordinary ways. His work was so deceptively simple that many naive people like me felt that they could take pictures too. This simplicity led to his work being called snapshots. My drawings are often called doodles. Winogrand hated the term snapshot almost as much as I hate the word doodle. He says of the term snapshot, the people who use the term don't even know the meaning. They use it to refer to photographs they believe are loosely organized or casually made, whatever you want to call it, whatever terms you like. The fact is, when they're talking about snapshots, they're talking about the family album picture, which is one of the most precisely made photographs. Everybody's 15 feet away and smiling. The sun is over the viewer's shoulder. That's when the picture is taken, always. It's one of the most carefully made photographs that ever happened. To make something look simple is actually very complex. So doodle, snapshot, let's never use these terms again, okay? Number seven, the more I do, the more I do. Winogrand said, I don't lay myself down on the couch to figure out why I'm a photographer and not this or that. Whatever it is, I can't seem to do enough of it. It's a pleasure 
What I found out over photographing a long time, the more I do, the more I do. I still stutter a bit when people ask me what it is that I do. Um, these days, I feel pretty comfortable calling myself an illustrator who teaches and sometimes organizes events and who draws for herself, but for other people too, and sometimes gets paid for it. Okay, I still have problems with this question. Um, but I do know that I really like what I do. And the more I do it, the more there is to do. <laughs> and I think that this is a good thing. Okay, number eight. Smile and act like you are supposed to be here, even if you are filled with complete terror. Taking pictures of strangers and talking to strangers is scary, but Winogrand seemed to do it with ease. Winogrand was caught up with the energy of his subjects and was constantly smiling or nodding at people as he shot. It was as if his camera was secondary and his main purpose was to communicate and make quick but personal contact with people as they walked away. He didn't try to be invisible. By many accounts, people remember their days with Winogrand to have been full of hilarity and enthusiasm, but he has been quoted as saying, I function out of terror. I still take photos, but not as seriously as I once used to. Once I fell into drawing, I fell into it pretty madly and pretty deeply. Photography, however, gives me the most anxiety out of anything I do. I put my camera down seriously once the iPhone came along. Not that I don't think good photography can be shot with the iPhone. There are plenty of people using their iPhones to make incredible images. I just don't think I'm one of them. I also think I put my camera down because I thought I got too busy. And maybe I put my camera down because I was looking in different ways. Since I picked this image, World's Fair, New York City, to talk about for this essay, I haven't thought about photography and Winogrand this much in over 12 years. So 12 years ago, Winogrand gave me permission to pick up my camera after a long hiatus. And I think he just gave me permission to pick it back up again today. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> It was 5,418,000 images. Okay. Some developed, some not. Some are contact sheets, some not contact sheets. Yeah. That, yeah. Would you say that his most refined and uh, uh, talent and skill was editing? No. <laughs> he's actually been, he's got on the record saying how much he hates editing. His filing system is a disaster. That's another area where I'm like, <laughs> ah, Gary Winogrand could, I feel like I want him to be my like great uncle because I'm like, I have a terrible filing system. He has a terrible filing system. He was talking about how um, it's just, it, it becomes treacherous for him to even look for negatives. And um, it just, he is, again, it's really about the process of shooting. So. So he, he, what you're saying is that everything he did was as of equal. Not of equal, no, not of equal at all. I just said that he didn't, he didn't like to edit. I think he, he just didn't like to edit. Which is, editing's hard. It's one of the hardest things to do is to edit. So I don't blame them, honestly. <laughs> yes? Could you uh, tell us some things about, uh, about the photo? Just that paragraph I read. <laughs> I mean, there's really not a lot to be found, uh, like historically. I'm not an art historian or a photo historian, so I'm really only able to, to talk about the photo. I guess what I'm asking, what engages you? Oh. I'll read my paragraph that I just read. <laughs> About the people, well, I mean, like I said in the talk that I just gave, what, I, what, draw me, what drew me to this photograph was the rhythm and the movement and just wondering what the women were talking about, why is she sad, the movement of the hands as I was drawing this image. There was so much motion to be kind of explored with with my pencil. Um, I want to know what they're looking at. I want to know what he's reading. I want to know what they're talking about. I want to know if she's laughing or yawning. I want to know if she's talking about that person. I mean, there's so many different things that the, the photograph, it's so energetic. There's no way, again, like anyone could orchestrate that type of action. Did, did he also um, change the framing of it when, uh, in, the, in the dark? Did 
He didn't crop. He was. He didn't crop. He didn't crop. He was. He didn't crop. Yeah, and that's that's definitely something too. I think the more um, I learned about him when I was in school, and then again now, it's just the whole kind of cropping. I try not to do that even when I shoot on Instagram. I've been trying to like not do the square crop. I've been trying to actually just upload the frame that I shot. And it's actually really difficult because I feel now, I mean, we're so used with digital photography. It's so easy to upload it into our phone, look at it, add a filter crop, tilt it, do all these millions of things to actually upload a photograph that has no cropping to it. Again, it's, it's mega restraint, so. But you have to be thinking about what it is before you take that picture, too. And I think that's what, with him shooting so much, so much, so much, so much, he was able to really frame up a shot right as he took, right as he took the, the image, too. So, yeah. You're, you're an illustrator. Yeah. Um, and you talked about how you, you're a rapid fire person, which apparently you are. <laughs> Shooting something, I guess I think about photography when you're shooting like that, there's some, a certain amount of mystery to it. You're surprised when you're in the development mm -hmm. process and when you get the pictures back from the, from the store. Yeah. It comes back to you. But it seems like the drawing process is different because you've already got an outcome in mind when you sit down with, um, with a pen and ink or. Well, I mean, one of the ways that. How is, I find myself either being completely bored by the things that I draw sometimes or completely surprised. Um, and there's, especially when I'm drawing for myself too. And one of the rules that I had set for myself with a lot of my long-term drawing projects is that I, I don't erase things, I don't use a pencil, and if I feel like a line is screwing up, I have to go with it. And that actually, I feel like by kind of creating those rules for myself with my own drawing projects, that turned into uh, kind of unexpected surprises too. Because what would be a line that you know I threw down that I thought was, oh, this is crap, I'd have to work with it and go with it, and it would actually turn into something that was better than I had originally intended to. So I guess maybe there's some parallels with, with shooting too, because that would surprise me. But I, I, I didn't. I, I, I didn't scrap drawings. I just kind of went with it to see what would happen. Do you set a time frame around? Is it timing one of the rules on your drawings? Um, usually all of my, when I was doing my daily purchase drawing project, um, it usually was between you know 10 and 30 minutes. So I never really labored too much longer than 30 minutes. So it was quick. <laughs> Editing's hard. <laughs> well, how do you know what to present? I mean, you do a lot of work. And well, I have a show that's coming up that's called More, More, More. So maybe, <laughs> again, maybe editing's not. Um, <laughs> I kind of, uh, I, I like to fill a room. And I think editing does happen, but it's more in the arrangement, the arrangement and the installation process. Um, for example, the show that I'm going to be having is going to be featuring 2,921 drawings. And so it's, I'm not really editing any of that. It's, it's at uh, Liquid Space. It's Liquid Agency. It's not, it's a, it's a, it's a branding agency in town. It's, uh, ninth, it's Northwest 9th and Hoyt. Yeah, opening September 5th. I did not mean to plug. That was so not my intention for that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but editing is hard. It is hard. But I definitely, I do edit because I mean, there's some crap I don't want to show. <laughs> I think you kind of regret not keeping some of those photos when you were a photographer in Branson, right? Oh, right. see, that's that just only, already plays into my hoarding tendencies, <laughs> where I'm like, I should have kept all of that, and I did. I mean, like, it was just I would just throw them all out because again, I just wasn't paying attention. I didn't. Well, I No, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's 19 year old girl hanging out with her friends photography. You know, I mean, it's, there's something that's nostalgic about it, but it's nothing that I would ever want to show. <laughs> yeah. Yes.
really striking about this exhibit uh, is uh, the layers and depth that uh, Linda Graham is able to get and also Graham, I guess is the other mm -hmm. uh, first, in, in, the black, in black and white photography. So most digital photography today, that at least that I've seen, it tends to be in color, which sometimes can be very distracting and I think sometimes take away from the depth. So how do you uh, relate black and white photography at, at this level with some of the illustration and other photography that you do? All my illustrations tend to be black and white. <laughs> um, and it's, a lot of my installations have a lot of color in them, but my drawings don't have any color. So um, I use a lot of color, but with my drawings, my preferred, my preferred method is, is, is black pen. So I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how to answer your question. I don't <laughs> but I do love color. Um, Absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's one reason why, I mean, I'm assuming this still happens now, any photo student starts learning in black and white. And the same thing goes whenever I am, whenever I'm teaching uh, branding to my students, and we talk about making a logo. Everyone wants to immediately jump to color, and I'm, we're not even touching color until you've got a solid lockup for what your mark's going to be. And after that's set, then we can start thinking about color, because color can be used as a crutch. Honestly, and um, I think it's really it's it's essential that a foundation starts in black and white because then you can focus on so many, so many of the essential things that you need to be focusing on, form and and movement and repetition and really focusing on the content, and then you can add the color. So. So what do you feel about the the, the, the photographer artists I should say not photographers but artists that use color photography uh, for composed imagery like your, our common friend Holly, for example. Yeah, I, I love, I love, I, I still love that photography. Absolutely, I mean, I still, I still absolutely love Holly Andreas. I, because that's more painting than Absolutely, you. absolutely, I love Cindy Sherman. I, I, I again, it, that absolutely plays into my theatrical and dramatic tendencies. Like, that's, that's something that, again, I think, I think, I, it's a it's a different way of making pictures. It's a different. It's just a different way of doing it. So yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yes. You know that's a good question. That's a good question because I've known um, plenty of photographer friends who really only feel like they can shoot well in black and white, and their color stuff does fall flat. But I feel like. I don't, I don't know if it's a crutch. I feel like you just kind of figure out what it is that you feel, feel good working with. It's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's telling what it is that you want to be, if, if it's working for you, you should keep working with it. Um, so I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily think of it as a, as a crutch. If you feel like you're moving forward in what it is that you're intending to make, then I think that's a good thing. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, did you pick your this day for your um, presentation because of this? It just it happened to work out beautifully, honestly. <laughs> that worked out because I was actually scheduled to talk in July. And I was speaking at a conference on that day. And so I wasn't able to do it. And so then we shifted to him. like, OK, this is great. It's worked out wonderfully. <laughs> and then I was, I was, I'm like, well, of course this image has to be shown. And it, it was. It's on display. So I, that was my first panic. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So it worked out well. OK. Are there any of these other photos that really speak to you? Or is this his body of work? His body of, again, like, I, 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 I really appreciate how many of his photos are in here. Um, I also, another one of my favorite images of his is the, the woman holding the ice cream in front of the storefront window with the mannequin, because it kind of combines. I, I absolutely love Beatrice Abbott and all of her storefront photography that she, oh, she's fantastic. And then having, it just feels like a combination of, of two people that I, I really love. Um, and then it, there's one photo that isn't of, it's of dogs, and there's a woman that's behind all the dogs. And there's, I also like dogs. So, <laughs> and so I really like Gary Winogrand's dogs. 
but I'm a dork, so there you go. <laughs> yes? I haven't, and I'm, I'm, I haven't even seen the movie yet, and I live a block away from Laurelhurst, and it's been there for a month and a half, and it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, and I, it's, it's, it's stupid that I haven't been over there yet. So, yeah, I'm gonna go see it. Now I feel bad. <laughs> no. Well, it, yeah, and there, I mean, there's a, there's a controversy in that, too, because I feel like, Winogrand had thousands and thousands and thousands of rolls of film that weren't processed when he passed away. And I know that the, um, the retrospective that is happening in New York City right now, a lot of the plates that were printed are edited and printed after his death. And so, but I mean, I, 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 don't, have, I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I'm also, I, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's fine. But that's, I don't really have any good like, reasoning behind that. I, I don't find it, I know some people find it disrespectful or some people don't find it in his vision. But it's part, again, it's part, of, it's part of the process. It's part of some of the frames that he shot. So let's print them and let's see them. So, OK. Yes, Julie. I, again, and I think this is what drew me to Winogrand several years ago, too. I, I like the accessibility of a small size. It's not intimidating. And, and again, it, it kind of, it, it feels more intimate. And I like things to be big. I like things to be overpowering, but I also, like to feel like this photograph could be mine if I wanted it to. Like my whole like frame fills the frame that I'm looking at. Like I'm having this experience with this image, and I'm not sharing it with anybody else. And um, that's that's a that's a nice, powerful feeling to have with a piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. Do you know what um, format film you use? Or I'm thinking probably 35 millimeter. I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody know? 35. 35. That's what I was, yeah, I was, I was just guessing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. <laughs> anybody have technical questions? The man in the front will be able to answer them for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.